Hello and welcome to the Your Financial Pharmacist Real Estate Investing Podcast, a show all about empowering pharmacists to achieve financial freedom through real estate investing. I'm Nate Hedrick, and each week, my co-host David Bright and I explore stories from pharmacists all over the country who are achieving their real estate goals while maintaining a meaningful career in pharmacy. Whether you're a first-time investor or a seasoned pro, we're here to provide education and inspiration about the world of real estate. Please note, this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and should not be considered financial or investment advice. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, good, thanks. How you doing, man? Good, good. I'm excited. We just had a, a great discussion with an awesome pharmacist and it's uh, it's got me jacked up again about, about vacation properties, which I feel like happens to me a lot on this show, uh, but it was it was a really good conversation. Yeah, we just interviewed uh, Mike Crow, who's a fellow Michigan pharmacist, and he's been very active in the profession. Uh, he was just inaugurated as the 2022 president of the Michigan Pharmacists Association, and it's fun to uh, to hear about his real estate investing as well as his professional career. Yeah, I really like just how approachable and how relatable Mike's investing kind of progress has been. He started off kind of like many other pharmacists, like I wish I would have done, right? House hacking and, and simple house hacking. He did short-term rental unit within his basement and he moved on to syndications, right? About as passive as you can get in, in real estate investing. And now he's getting to the point where he's starting to turn more active, looking at a glamping vacation resort as his next opportunity. So just this progression is, I think, really relatable. And, and a lot of pharmacists can see themselves kind of in the same the same window. Yeah, the, the concept of glamping had me just super intrigued and in wanting to to make sure that we got Mike on the show. Uh, you know, glamping or that kind of luxurious camping accommodation opportunity. It just again super unique, and I I love how Mike talked us through why that's a fit for him and his family in their season of life and what their goals are, and, and how that all kind of aligns as something that's really logical for them, but certainly wasn't on my radar before this. Yeah, likewise. I and now I'm kind of my head is spinning with with opportunities there. But I also like when Mike talked about some of the the early entries he had in the real estate investing and how he used his 401k to actually invest in real estate and how he's able to accomplish that. And and again, in a super passive way, something that I think any pharmacist could look at and say, "Yeah, this might be a good fit for me." So I I just I loved all the different ideas that Mike threw at us tonight. It was a it was a cool grab bag of 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 ideas for investing. Yeah. And, and I like to, Nate, what you're saying about any pharmacist. I know sometimes we will have guests that are incredibly active in their real estate and sometimes that can feel intimidating. Yeah. But like you said, this is super relatable. This is ways to be involved in real estate investing uh, without investing a lot of time. And so uh, particularly with the 401k, the passive investing, that kind of thing. So yeah, definitely. I think Mike is a great role model for how you can have a very meaningful career in pharmacy and yet also be a real estate investor. Yeah, something we talk about on the show all the time. So I think, again, really relatable topic for us. So hope you guys enjoy. And with that, we'll take you right to the episode. Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. Hi, Nathan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We're excited to, to chat tonight. I know, uh, David, you have had a chance to connect, but it's our first time meeting. So this is a great chance for us to, to learn more about you. So I appreciate it. Good to be here. So why don't you just jump right in? Tell us a little bit about your pharmacy story, your your journey so far. Yeah, well, uh, I am a first generation pharmacist. I don't know exactly what I wanted to do uh, in early high school, even later in high school, but I had narrowed it down to the closely related fields of architecture and culinary school. <laughs> a friend of my parents actually shared an article uh, with them about a really good outlook for pharmacists. This was back in. 2001, 2002-ish. And I had known that I liked science and we had a kind of a career day at my high school, junior, senior year, and there was a recruiter from Rite Aid there. So that kind of between the article and that recruiter talking up a career in community pharmacy and mentioning maybe paying some of my tuition that lured me in. And I got a job with Rite Aid right after my uh, senior year in high school, leading up to my freshman year at Ferris State University, and enjoyed everything I learned about pharmacy from there on there on forward. It's been a, a good career. You've had a, a busy career too. You've you've had some pretty unique experiences plus 
pretty early in your career. I was there to see you inducted as president of the Michigan Pharmacists Association. So you've had some some great honors in your career as well as a pharmacist. So I've been real fortunate to have a, a lot of good role models uh, here in Michigan and in the professional pharmacy to, to kind of lead me into those opportunities. No, that, that's fantastic. I've gotten to see you at, at least in that role with pharmacy. And so I'm excited to talk with uh, about the real estate side of things as well. So talk us through your your just big picture of your real estate journey so far and, and kind of the why behind real estate investing for you. I'm kind of still new into the area. I think I always kind of had an interest in managing my money well, been big into budgets and tools that support that. I, I use the Mint app uh, pretty regularly just to keep my budgets in place and see where my accounts are at. But my investing up until just a couple of years ago was really just my 401k and then establishing a kind of a baseline savings account. But uh, then really my uh, wife and I, when we moved in to rent, which is another story, uh, our landlords are actually friends as well that uh, had been doing multifamily real estate active investing. And they talked to us about it. They had a project in the works at, also in Michigan, and we had an opportunity to invest there. And uh, since then, we've invested in property in Florida as well through kind of the same syndicate. That's great. And I know David mentioned to me before we, we got to, to hit record that you've done some some entrepreneurial things before the real estate, right? So, so we talk a lot about real estate on the show, but we also talk all things entrepreneurship. And you've had some kind of pharmacy focused entrepreneurial activities before the rental real estate even even came in. So maybe you can share a little bit about that first and how maybe that jump started you toward toward some of this other uh, endeavors. Yeah, I had some cool opportunities uh, pharmacy wise. Uh, before I finished pharmacy school, I was doing my rotations in the Grand Rapids area, part of Kent County. And my preceptor, uh, a past president of the Michigan Pharmacists Association, Paul Jensen, had invited me to a Kent County Pharmacists Association local meeting. And as those things often go, you get invited and then you get asked to serve on the board and volunteer. <laughs> and so I did. And I, uh, I spent that year on their board as well as my year during my residency in Grand Rapids on, on the Kent board. But then I got hired on with Diplomat, a company that was based on the other side of the state. That's in Genesee County. And we had no local association, which was where I grew up as well. So I was kind of missing that uh, local pharmacy uh, networking that, that you can do through a local association and decided that uh, we would restart the Genesee County Pharmacists Association. So I did that, uh, brought together some pharmacists. The Michigan Pharmacists Association gave me resources of who were members, who were past members 20 years ago when it was still active and we re reactivated, cool. had to uh, incorporate with Michigan and get the nonprofit status with the IRS and some other things, built a website for the association. And it was just a good learning experience for all those different things that I'd never done before. I love that. It's a perfect example of, of what a lot of people go through buying their first investment property, buying, you know, the first house. Like there's all these pieces that we, we kind of know, right? Like we look, we know a little bit about it. We know the right people to ask, but until you've done it, you don't have that experience. And so it's, it's, it's neat to see you getting that experience in a, in a very pharmacy centric way. Uh, and, and that can springboard you to, to being able to do it in other places as well. That's great. Yeah. I like too, that you had this way of taking an experience and and building from there, like you saw what was going on in Kent County, you're saying, I can go do this over here. So you were able to, to build those lessons, to lean on other people, to look to folks that had been in the organization years before. And it certainly seems like a lot of work along the way, but it seems like you found people that could help you and you, you saw a vision for what that could be by being in, in the Kent County organization too. And I, I feel like there's probably some parallels into uh, getting started in real estate because you said that your, your first venture into real estate was with uh, an Airbnb in your basement. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. My my first home, I was uh, living in it uh, by myself and it had a, had a basement uh, with a bedroom and bathroom and, and living space. And I didn't use it that much. And I'm not sure how exactly I had the idea. I'd probably used Airbnb before for personal getaways and things like that. And just decided I'd, I'd put it to work and offset some of, some of my mortgage uh, by listing it on Airbnb. 
overall, it was a pretty good experience. I mean, they make it pretty simple for, for you to do to go ahead and list something there. Maybe my one one night guests weren't uh, too profitable by the time I turned over the rooms, but uh, I did have uh, a few guests. And by that time, my wife and I were married and she was living there as well. So we did that a little little ways after we got married, but uh, we had these uh, grandparents that would come in from one of the Carolinas to visit their, their grandchildren and they'd stay with us pretty routinely. And I also had a nurse a traveling nurse that, that stayed for about two months, actually, uh, while she was working across the street at, at one of the local hospitals in my town. So those those were good good returns because they were, they were repeat and stayed for multiple days. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you saw something that was working when you stayed there as a, as a tenant in someone else's Airbnb, and then you were able to draw upon those experiences, do something there. So how long did you then keep that rental for or, or, or do that? I think we refer to that often as as a, a house hack, right? Where you're able yeah. to defray the cost of your own personal residence by renting out a space to others. So that's a pretty creative way to do that. How long was that period of time that you were able to do that for? I think we did about two years and my wife persuaded me that it was time to stop when we had our first daughter. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. After that, you actually took a pivot that most most of our investors, most of our guests don't, right? Instead of moving to more rentals, right? You you actually became a renter yourself, right? So tell me a little bit about that and then what that what that process looked like and why you guys made that choice. Yeah, it was a unique situation. The home that we were in, we we knew wasn't our forever home. It had some updates that needed to be done that we knew we weren't going to get our money back on uh, when we did sell the home. So we started looking and we found a really great home, fell in love with it, put an offer in on it, contingent on the sale of our home and the offer was accepted. So we listed our house and we actually listed it for slightly higher than our agent suggested we should. This was about three-ish years ago. So kind of a COVID had been happening, but uh, the housing market impact of it hadn't fully settled in. We got an offer for our full asking price. Mm. And meanwhile, the appraisal on the house we were going to move into came back and it came back six figures shy of the offer price. Yikes. And and it wasn't it wasn't a multi million dollar home, so the margin <laughs> of discrepancy was pretty big. And you know we wanted to come up a little bit, the sellers wanted to come down a little bit, but we couldn't meet in the middle. It was too much cash to, cash to bring to the table. So we uh, contemplated our situation. We had a really high offer. It was probably about twenty percent more than I paid for the home just four or five years earlier. And we knew it wasn't going to be our forever home, so we we said. Well, let's let's take this good offer. It's not like we had multiple offers, people fighting over it. Uh, I think it was just good timing, and the people that wanted to move had found us and liked our home. So we said, let's let's take the offer and become better buying candidates for whatever would be our forever home. Unfortunately, we're we're still renting now because <laughs> COVID made it uh, a little bit difficult. But nonetheless, we're still at least saving some money on. Things like uh, property taxes, HOA fees, and and some other things. So, even though we're not building equity, at least we're saving some money in those areas. I like that though. It doesn't have to always be the same lockstep as what everybody else is recommending, right? Sometimes it makes sense to make that move and allocate resources in a new way, and and take take what you can get when you can, right? It it, it probably ended up being a pretty decent move for you. Yeah, it's been it's been nice to downsize and. Another benefit, it's taken a lot of things off my plate. I don't, I'm not responsible for, for maintenance here. Right. It frees up some time for other projects. You mentioned too that it was right about this time that you moved into this house that's a rental house that you were able to begin some additional investing. And so I think one thing, I think it's just worth emphasizing that it seems like a lot of pharmacists start off with this. You graduate, you get a car and a house of your own, and then you think about investing. And so you didn't have to be a homeowner at this point in order to invest in real estate. You're able to invest in real estate while renting. So uh, I'm curious how that started. And you mentioned the syndication. If you could talk us through that for a minute. My sister was the one who introduced me to the the landlords at, at this condo. They ha- It's a multi-unit condo and they had been in multifamily real estate investing this was a project of their own that they had bought and renovated and were leasing out. They actually had just finished our our unit the day we were able to move into it from selling our home. So it was really good timing. 
within a few months of us moving in, we were acquaintances too, uh, friends of friends through the same high school. They, they invited us over and uh, kind of explained to us a little bit about this multifamily real estate investing, the syndicate that, that they're a part of. And they had a, a property that was going to be available for passive investing in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, you know, the returns just look really good, really lucrative, uh, a lot better than, than the standard stock market, 8% <laughs> in a good year uh, type returns. We liked the idea of diversifying our investments, uh, taking some out from you know, the standard 401k stock market investments and doing something different. It just made sense where there was room for, for the type of profit that was to be made in, in that type of investment. And and so in in doing that, I know you mentioned with the four hundred and one k funds. So you're you're saying that you were able to take retirement funds and invest those in through the syndication in a portion of. You didn't buy the whole place in Kalamazoo. This was a share of or a portion of, yeah. right? Yep, yep. We we invested. There was a minimum investment, and we did something around there with with some four hundred and one k funds. It was actually a might be a pretty unique situation for for me, but there might be other listeners out there that that could find themselves in this situation it just depends on what what their what their 401k is set up uh, what rules there are around it yeah I know we've talked in the past about syndications with some other guests and in, in terms of as a great way to buy in and be extraordinarily passive is that what you're you're finding as well now that you've kind of dove in on the other side that that you know it's really just about as passive as you can get and it almost feels like another option within your 401k yeah it is, I mean it is pretty passive we once you uh, wire the funds over, fill out the paperwork, I mean, we get maybe a monthly update on each of our investments and the payouts are on a quarterly basis usually. But other than that, it's just sit back and let, let it ride, <laughs> let it happen. Uh, usually they're about five or six years in, in length, depending on okay. when they uh, divest the property or sell it, sell it off. Yeah. That, and that's a good clarifier, right? This is not something you can buy into and just you know, sell out of the next year a lot of times, right? There, there's limits right. and restrictions on that. Are there other restrictions that, again, this is probably a better question for somebody's accountant, right? But but even so, I'll ask yeah. it. You know, are there restrictions on like, can you do the work yourself? Can you be a property manager? Like, how, you know, what are the things that you can and can't do with like a 401k style investing? Because I think we haven't talked about that on the show before. And I'm sure a number of people listening to this now are, are, are intrigued. Like, oh, how do I do that? Can I do that? Yeah, so maybe I should give a little bit of a history on, on how how I did that. Yeah, the first employer I had after my residency was Diplomat Pharmacy, and when I left them, uh, I rolled my four hundred one k funds over into my next employer, which was with Walgreens, and then continued to build my four hundred one k with Walgreens while I was with them. When I met these uh, our, our landlords and, and friends who were doing the multifamily investing, they talked about different ways to invest, whether it be cash, IRA, 401k, and uh, referred me to a person who knows a lot more about that uh, type of thing. And we found out that with the Walgreens 401k, by checking with my employer and, and the plan sponsor, that usually you're not allowed to roll out funds from your employer's 401k unless you leave the company. But if you've rolled funds in from another 401k plan, you can roll those funds and any gains that they've had back out. Hmm. Additionally, I learned that there's such thing as a solo 401k or a self-directed 401k. And you can establish one of those if you have your own uh, kind of sole proprietorship or LLC, which which I had uh, through a, a pharmacy consulting business that I, that I started as kind of just a side hustle. But uh, because I had that, I was able to establish the solo 401k, roll funds out of my Wal Walgreens 401k, and then use the funds in, in the solo 401k to do the passive real estate investing. Hmm. So kind of a, a, an alignment of the stars um, for, for all that to, to work out. But uh, you know, some, some people might be, might be in a similar situation, possibly. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that might resonate with that, right? You change jobs from one to another. You probably didn't bother rolling over the 401k from the last place. It's probably still sitting out there untouched. And this might be a good opportunity for some people. And again, a, a great question for a tax professional about, hey, how's the best way I can do this? And then like you said, you mentioned too, you know, checking with your plan sponsor, right? Don't just assume this is going to work out. Check with your plan sponsor first. Make sure you're lining it up the right way. But if it's if you're looking to do more passive 
investing and you would like to diversify into real estate, this is a great way to consider that. I, I think that's awesome. It's a great, great idea to bring up for our guests or for our audience. I know that um, one of the potential downsides of that is, is, as you mentioned, it's not very liquid, right? You're buying into a share of an investment, and then you said that that may sit there for five plus or minus years. So um, it's not it's not as liquid as like a REIT or some of those other options, but certainly there. And still probably, you mentioned about it being relatively passive compared to owning your own real estate. However, one of the, one of the reasons why I was really excited to talk with you tonight is you've been sharing on social media about glamping as an investment strategy and getting into real estate. And we've, we've not talked with anyone else uh, on the podcast about this strategy. So I'd love if you could just do like a, a glamping 101 and what got you intrigued about this kind of real estate investing as your next move. Bit of a long story, but the short version is uh, after we moved and became renters, we kept looking for a home that was always part of the plan and came across this beautiful 176 acre piece of unimproved farmland, very peaceful, secluded, quiet, but it was nothing we would ever practically own just for our residents to be on. I knew that if we could put the land to work and pay for some of it through a business operating on the land, that that may make it an option. Before I even knew what glamping was, we had in our mind, maybe we do an event barn and some overnight accommodations for the guests just promoting the the nature and, and, and the peacefulness. Well, eventually we got rid of the event barn knowing that that kind of takes away from the peacefulness on weekends. If you've ever been to a, an outdoor event barn wedding, uh, like, like ours was, but, um, we kept the overnight accommodations and, uh, last year we realized that glamping was, was a thing, not just a thing, but a, a growing industry. We actually went to the North American glamping show in, in Aurora, Colorado last October. And it was just acres of all these different glamping structures. So to answer your question of glamping, it's just one way it's described as a more luxurious form of camping where the accommodations are, are nicer. You have a real bed and heating and cooling, a kitchen, a private bathroom. The structure's already set up. There's no packing up the tent and, and setting up your camper when you arrive it's it's there it's ready to go when you arrive and it's predicted to grow quite a bit over the next uh several years and these are these are overnight rates uh charging between 200 and 300 dollars a night there's one company out there that says if you have land you have <laughs> a glamping <laughs> property which to a degree is right uh, but as you know if you followed our social media we're looking for the right piece of land with maybe some uh additional features to draw people in that's kind of been one one project we've been kind of working on on the side is finding the land to establish a glamping resort on. I love that idea. Now my head is spinning with like, if you can find the right piece of land to draw people in and then get the right marketing materials, like all of a sudden you're you're basically like running a hotel. Just it's a very short, you know, spread out hotel of of tents. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I would imagine too that the the. I, and again, I don't know all the terms here, but I would think of it like the cost per unit if I'm thinking about multifamily investing. And, and like yeah. Nate said, this is multifamily spread across a big field, right? So <laughs> the cost per unit, like if it's tents or campers or things like that, the cost per unit has got to be relatively small. And then to make a couple hundred dollars a night sounds like there could be a great, presumably there's quite a bit of land cost here, but but it sounds like it could be a, a very strong ROI doing some comparisons. There's a variety of different structures. Some of the more premium ones are some of the, uh, are the geodesic domes. Uh, mm -hmm. You're talking like 500 to 700 square feet of space insulated and all the way down to tiny, tiny cabins uh, where there's probably just room for a bed and a couple of chairs. In our model, we're, we're looking at having a bathroom and a kitchen in addition to a nice bed to sleep on. The, the return on investment uh, ranges anywhere from just less than a year all the way up to right around two years. So pretty reasonable return on investment, but yeah. because of things like getting electricity and uh, water and wastewater uh, treatment, i.e. septic or sewer to them, it does bump up the price a little bit, but that's why we're able to command two to $300 a night. Awesome. Well, I'm excited to hear more once you guys uh, figure that out. Maybe I'll come stay someplace. I like Michigan. Yeah, so if that's where you guys that. are buying, <laughs> I'm in. 
Well, Michael, I want to switch over to our final infusion questions. These are three questions we ask every guest on the show. I want to get your take. So the first one is what's one tangible strategy that you use to make sure that your investing works hand in hand with your busy career as a pharmacist? Yeah, I, uh, I got these questions in advance, advance, thankfully. So I had some time to give them a little <laughs> bit of thought to be transparent. But uh, you know what I came up with, tangible strategy, definitely consider what your time is worth. We're pretty fortunate as pharmacists to command a pretty good hourly rate. So it doesn't always make sense to take active roles in real estate investing. Yeah, there's some ways we can save money doing things ourselves, but there's always like an opportunity cost uh, where we could be doing pharmacist work if it's uh, something that someone else can do for us. Mm -hmm. You know, that being said, there's always some things you only trust yourself to do or you want to do just for the enjoyment of it. I like that. Yeah. I would imagine like picking out the parcel of land that you intend to buy for your glamping resort is something you want to be involved in, but maybe uh, yeah. maybe some of the tasks of improving the property and things like that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. What's one resource that's been most helpful for you in your real estate journey, whether that's a book, a podcast, a person, author, website, whatever that would be? Yeah. It's pretty simple for us. Uh it, just because we're so young in in the real estate uh, investing world, but it's just those those friends of ours that that introduced us to multifamily uh, real estate. That was really the jumping off point for us moving from a traditional four hundred one k to to doing something in the real estate space. But that shows how important connections are, right? Don't don't shut yourself down to having those conversations about money with other people because you never know what you're going to develop a r relationship with or find an opportunity with. So I think that's great. Definitely. All right. And then our last question, what's one piece of advice that you'd give to a pharmacist contemplating a start in real estate investing? Uh, I'm definitely not an accountant. So <laughs> take, <laughs> take my advice with a grain of salt. And a lot of it's probably what you'd hear from a financial planner, but I'd say get your priorities straight, pay your debts first, establish a savings, max out your employer's uh, 401k program and their match if they're offering one and attempt, I, I would say attempt to do it tax deferred if, if possible like I have the privilege of being able to do through a, a self-directed 401k. If you do invest with cash assets um, or with cash, make sure you're, uh, you know, consider the tax burden of any returns you're going to get on that and, yeah. and can bear pay those or have plans to pay for those when, when uh, April comes around. I like it. Like I had mentioned earlier, I've been following what you've been doing on social media. It's been, it's been an inspiring journey to watch from the, the business plan competition and some of the photos that you put out there of the, the different options that you're looking at. It's, it's been a great story. So if people are looking to follow what you're doing and some of your ne next steps, where can people find you? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Uh, we are on most social channels, but uh, probably the easiest two would be Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, that's where the most happens. Our, our company is called Mitten Getaways Glamping Company. Mitten uh, for what we affectionately refer to our state, Michigan as. So yeah, they can, or they can go to uh, mittengetaways.com and sign up for our newsletter. We try to put out a little fun monthly newsletter with a little more details than our social media conveys. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to hear more about this as it develops. And again, just really happy you could come on the show today, share a little bit about what you've been up to. And again, give our audience an awesome way to consider a passive form of real estate investing, right? With with the funds they probably already have. You know, I, I think that's that has a lot of value. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you like what you heard on today's show, please leave us a review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. If you have a question, know someone that would make a good guess or want to connect with Nate or David, head on over to yfprealestate.com and join the growing YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook group. As we conclude this week's episode of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast, an important reminder that the content in this podcast is provided to you for your informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding materials should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archived newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on this podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist, unless otherwise noted, and constitute judgments as of the dates published. 
Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you for your support of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. Have a great rest of your week.